Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. Today is Tuesday, July 25th, 2023. My name is Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian and the archivist here at the Bronx County Historical Society. And today I am joined by, would you like to introduce yourself? Marco de Jesus de la Guagua. Great, great. And we like to start out all our old histories by asking you to tell us about your family history, background, and where your parents are from. Right. Could I could I do it with those spoken word piece that I Of remember? course. Any way you'd like to answer. All right. So I often share this to get people a sense of where I'm coming from as an artist. When I was a kid, sometimes the streets would melt with pavements and tar flowing like lava down sun-drenched, dangerously hot inner city summers of our distant past. Innocent, I ran and played on those molten rivers, my friends explaining as necessary. Hey, white, he mixed it to the kids who didn't know who I was. And I'd head back home with a bit of the streets stuck to my shoes. Pebbles, tar, chicle, and everything that would melt together as it lay under the sun. Then at night I was lovingly locked in the house from my parents' fear of that dark where poverty mis- Perception and real danger dance to hip hop beats punctuated by hard truth and juvenile obscenity. But the steam coming off the funky flow of crazy sexy cool from my block, mixed with sweetly sacred incense, acridly organic ganja, and bitterly artificial cracked pipe smoke. This potent alchemy wafted up from the streets propelled by beats blasted out of hoopty speakers that cost more than the raggedy old cars which transported them. The smoke and sound entered my crib through windows left open for relief from the heat, and once inside it meant Bobby's full-throated Lamento Volcano, hymns of the mighty fortress that is our God, and Mommy's Motown Records. And in that old house that's now complicated... Right, Pastor, see you later. Jeez. This, and in that old house, this now complicated sound cloud circled and stirred up dust. And it swirled and it swirled around my small body. And I inhaled. I deeply inhaled. That was beautiful. Gracias, Pastor. That was really good. That was really good. And both your parents hail from where? Well, uh, I'm mixed in, like the kids said. They had that right. Um, so I am, so my, my parents met, what, one really strong connection to the Bronx is that my parents met in the Bronx, and I don't really imagine any other scenario in which they would have met, even, let alone that I would have, you know, they would have married and, and I, me and my sister would have come into the world. But on my dad's side, we're New Yorkian, three generations in the Bronx. On my mom's side, we're German American, four, no, five generations in, within, within 40 miles of a place um, called Freistadt, which is in Wisconsin. Um, but it means free town, free, free place. Um, so those were uh, people, those were religious refugees from uh, the, the Prussian Empire. And my mom uh, grew up on a dairy farm and she uh, took the gospel very seriously. And when she, uh, when, when she studied in college in Ann Arbor, Michigan, she visited Detroit and she met people who took the gospel seriously and expressed it with just this extremely warm welcome, you know? And she wanted, they, they, she was being educated to be a, a school teacher 
and so she wanted to teach at at the the church school Lutheran church school there in Detroit now I don't know how actually I never asked my mom how that she went from Detroit to the Bronx but I guess Detroit in the 70s just wasn't urban enough mm -hmm. in the way that urban is used as a euphemism right because <laughs> um, because that was very much um, a place in crisis but she found a lot of love there ah so there's some relationship in the church yeah I think that a man with the most Germanic name I have ever heard, I think it was Pastor Schlachtenhofen, who um, I think had some connection from Detroit and then to ministry in the South Bronx. So meanwhile, my father uh, had grown up. Um, well, bueno, my abuelita came from Arecibo and then um, to Santurce, and then to uh, Brooklyn, and then like back to Santurce, and then the Bronx. And I don't know what year she came to Brooklyn, not Santurce. <sighs> Brooklyn, okay, so she was born in 1915. And um, yeah, so like ante de la ciudadanía, right? Before Puerto Ricans were uh, branded US citizens, um, by I think the Jones Act, right, and that involved the draft. She was, a, mi bisabuelo, I only during the pandemic realized he probably died uh, from the flu pandemic. Yeah, my great grandfather, he probably died from the flu pandemic, uh, like the 1919 flu pandemic. Because Abuelita's story about him was that he, um, <laughs> was that, <laughs> He didn't want to go to war, so his way of hiding from the draft was that he just laid down, and then he died. And we only, like, only during the pandemic we realized, oh, that's kind of how a child might process what it looks like to die from the flu, you know, to get sick and, and die. And, and, he, and she also described him, her being kept away from him, you know. So Abuelita um, is a, was a, she, she lived till 108, um, almost 108, 107. She was three weeks short of 108th birthday. She just passed away this past March. And I am sad as hell <laughs> about it. So um, I'll probably have a lot of emotion. Um, I'm, I'm blessed to have known her for, for, for so long. It also means that her loss is, is bigger, you know. Uh, she's my favorite person in the world for, for so long. Um, what was her name? Uh, Maria Aviles de Jesus. So Aviles um, was, her, was her, her birth name. De Jesus was Abuelo's name. My Abuelo's name, my grandfather's name. And I didn't know him much. Um, and, uh, ah, so, um, Abuelo was, um, I, I also only learned, um, something about oral history is so important, Pastor. It's so important to do it. Um, you know, like this oral history project is a good initiative. It's also, it's like a process, you know, it's an ongoing conversation because there are things that Abuelita, there are stories she would tell again and again, you know, and stories that we never heard until her eighth decade or her ninth decade or her tenth decade of life, you know? Mm -hmm. And and one thing I'd never heard details on, and I don't even know if Papi knew, because um, it was before, he, it was around his birth, really, este, was that... Um, my my abuela and abuelo met in church. Um, <laughs> the uh, the Latine churches back in the day always used to have really long names. It seems like Fue Iglesia Evangelica Luterana de la Transfiguración, 
on um, on Prospect Avenue, and that's that's where I was baptized. I think that's where my father was baptized. Um, Abuelita uh, in Santurce, uh, me, my my great aunt who who raised her after both of her parents died by the time she was 10, um, only said, you have to go to church. She didn't care which one. Um, and and Titi didn't go to church herself. But um, so she tried out all the churches and she really liked the emphasis on, on grace and the singing at, at the Lutheran church. Mm -hmm. um, so that really, she, she, um, she embraced the church, um, and 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 it, it was central to her to her life work. Eventually, becoming a pastor when her church was finally ready to mm -hmm. ordain women. She was ordained at the age of sixty-five. Yeah, but the, the thing I I only learned um, after my own divorce um, is that. Even though abuelo and abuela had met in the church, like it was good enough, it was okay that they could mix socially, right? But um, when este abuelo wanted to marry my abuelita, my uh, abuelo Jose Miguel wanted to marry. Um, Marie or Maria uh, Aviles, his, um, my bis abuela, um, intervened and after and, and like demanded the end of the marriage, um, por diciendo que, que, um, Ella fue, um, este negrita de clase baja, right? Low class negrita, low class black woman, black girl. Um, so, like, abuelita um, gave birth to um, my father and bisabuela heard that he, and so apparently abuelo did like, I don't know, bounce or he, you know, he disappeared before my father was born. Yeah. Um, and I don't totally understand why, you know, your mom not liking, well, actually, no, I can't understand. <laughs> I really value my mom's opinion, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if my mom was totally against my marriage, even if I didn't think that the reason made sense, I can imagine how I might, how that would weigh on me at least. And, sure. and I don't know if, if Abuelo, maybe there was a, maybe it was financially dependent on her or, or some other issue. I don't, I never heard his side of it, right? But he was out of the picture and that, and um, Pero, Um, when Papi came out, the, the, what was your father's name? Uh, Jose Miguel Jr. Right. De Jesus. Jose Miguel de Jesus. Yeah. So he, he, he had, he had Abuelo's name, uh, his full, his full name, right? He was a junior. Um, neither of them liked the Jose though. They both went by Miguel. And that's so funny to me that if you don't like your name, you'll give it to your son. That's, that's, <laughs> so, that's such a weird thing. Uh, <laughs> but um, Jose Miguel Jr. Según la, la, la dama, chisme de la dama de la iglesia, salió tan lindo y tan rubio. And so he, he she heard that uh, my father had come out light. And literally they said Rubio, they said he came out blonde. And so then uh, Bisabuela Victoria, um, Victoria de Jesus, my, my great grandmother wanted to be 
what wanted to be in his life. Um, but a lot of damage had already been done, you know? Um, and um, Abuelita would, Abuelita Maria would tell stories about Victoria being very proud. She didn't say racist, but that, that's what it was, you know? Um, <laughs> and, and she would, um, yeah, so Abuelita would tell the story. Um, este, sí, Victoria pensaba que tenía sangre azul. Right, and she would like look at her, her skin and as it got thinner with age, and she would say, yo, yo tengo sangre azul. Victoria would claim that she had blue blood, but look, I have blue blood. You all have, all of us have blue blood. Um, <laughs> um, so um, yeah, Abuelo wasn't in the picture very much for my father. And, um, and uh, he was not, I barely met him, you know. Um, and, uh, uh, a, a lot of, um, the novel that I'm working on right now, um, or at least the fiction world that I'm writing in right now is, um, kind of fictionalizing these, these family conflicts, these family stories that growing up to me seemed, um, epic, like tall tales of the Bronx, you know? Um, and, um, and actually tackling a lot of the, the more painful sides of them that I didn't really understand as a kid, but in the context of, um, uh, one of these three primos that the world sees as white, brown, and black, you know, but they were raised as, as siblings and, um, they, the, the premise is that when he graduates from Bronx Community College, Miguelito uh, and Annie point out to Esteban um, how people treat him differently when he's wearing, when he's wearing a suit. And um, yeah, man, they think you look like a businessman. And Miguelito says, when I, who's cafe con leche skinned, um, says when I uh, when I dress up, people think I look like a mafioso. And um, Annie is the youngest the youngest cousin, and she's really bright. And uh, they'd read a lot of comics and detective fiction, and they have this idea that they're sure wouldn't work. They just think it'd be funny to try. Um, Esteban. Um, gets fake papers, um, and they set up a detective agency, um, and it, they're surprised how easy it is. Um, but they thought the whole thing was going to be a joke because the name they use is, um, cause it was all based on a joke that they had about the comic books that, um, since Captain America's shield only has one star on it, really he's Captain Puerto Rico. And they give um, Esteban the nickname Captain Puerto Rico because they're like, yo, that's just, that's just the Spanish version. Uh, when Esteban Rodriguez is just the Spanish version of Steve Rogers. Um, and anyhow, in, in an abstracted way, in a fictionalized way, it's, it lets me process this stuff that um, has been very, I know, painful for my father and for me in different ways of um, experiencing um, a big gulf between how you understand yourself mm -hmm. um, and how the world sees you, especially when it, it, it speaks to this gulf in, in your relationships, it, it, especially, yeah, how like um, I I've come to yeah for for me and for Papi it's like um, whatever color 
he was being read as if his cousins weren't white passing, it changed how he thought about himself. You know, that, that his, um, yeah. So, um, the, uh, the comic book world, anyhow, and the storytelling world, um, Let's you tackle these things in ways that have beginning things that don't have endings really in ways that have beginnings middle mm -hmm. uh, that have a beginning middle and an end you know? okay ground me pastor <laughs> yeah. awesome being from a mixed family uh, a new eurekan father yeah and a german uh, mother, german american yeah what kind of music did you listen to at home oh wow um yeah so um we definitely like disengaged with commercial mainstream. That was like the, that was the shared <laughs> uh, view. Cause, um, uh, okay. And so my, my story gets more complicated. My relationship with the Bronx is that um, me and my sister were both born here. Um, but Poppy got a job opportunity in um that was tied to like the activism stuff he'd done with the church um and with the united bronx parents in new york uh he got a job opportunity in denver and then that job fell through and then we fell back to where my close to where my mom's people were so i grew up mostly in milwaukee wisconsin i can still feel the ill mill I do, I do, I became a man in Milwaukee. It's a damn good place to me. I do not, uh, I'm proud of that. But I was uh, just so freaking influenced. I was creative um, and um, and so was my sister and our, our, we had a tío in New York who loved the arts. So we always wanted to be in New York. Both of us always wanted to be in New York and I stayed. <laughs> I came back and New York, where were you born? The Bronx. So I was born, uh, when I was born, we lived in uh, Van Ness. Uh, so just north of Parkchester. Um, you're in the Bronx. You're in the Bronx, yeah, yeah. Um, and then we moved to Denver when I was a baby. And I lived in Milwaukee from when I was seven till 23. But now I've lived in the Bronx. Uh, I moved to New York uh, in 03, and I moved to the Bronx in 05. Um, and yeah, for me, like um, just being in the Bronx was probably the clearest life goal I had. I wanted to, I wanted to be in the Bronx. Um, and so that relates back to the music question that you asked. Like if we'd had a, a, a salsa radio station in Milwaukee, that probably would have been on, but there wasn't. So, you know, music that we had um, that was most important. My mom really had a lot of affection for Motown. Um, but, but apart from that, it was the music we made ourselves, you know? Um, so my father <laughs> would always be singing, uh, if, if he was at, uh, home and the task he was doing could be, you know, you could multitask it with singing, like, cocinando, mm -hmm. este, siempre. Uh, limpiando siempre estaba cantando um, and boleros and um, and danzas um, and that and that had come from my abuelita too um, like uh, washing dishes she would always sing especialmente danzas danza bolero y tangos um, and we had drums in the house from at least the age of seven um my my padrino uh abe caceres is a musicologist and he taught um i learned um uh, bass tone bass tone bass tone tone bass tone uh <laughs> and huckleberry pie for us to eat now those are the mellow rhythms he taught us when i was like seven at this after school program um, for plena and merengue. 
So um, I definitely, most importantly, music was um, a do-it-yourself thing. And me and my sister, we would sing. We got into, oh, our first visit, whenever we visited Abuelita in New York, she would take us to musicals. And we really liked a chorus line, which I, we saw when I was four, completely age appropriate. Do not take a four-year-old to a chorus line, but it worked out. Um, age inappropriate, I should say. But um, and we had, I think we had the eight track, and then the tape, and then the CD of it, and we would it would be playing in the car. And uh, eventually, we knew it by heart. So me and my sister would just sing all. Uh, we'd sing through musicals or, um, yeah, Nat King Cole songs. We knew a lot of those by heart. Um, so any anytime there was a car trip, uh, we would be seen. Great, great. So growing up in the Midwest until you were 23, yeah. what kind of uh, Puerto Rican experiences did you have? Were there any festivals in Detroit, Milwaukee yeah. you know, that you attended? How was that? Uh, and yeah. what year was that? It Probably. really wasn't. Yeah, so like, uh, so 87 to 2003. I'm in Milwaukee, and it was like being Puerto Rican was very. It was interesting because, um, yeah, like Lat Latino wasn't even really a thing you could be. You were white or black, you know. Um, the schools were eighty percent African American, and students were actually called like in the diversity, you know, um, math that would come up in. In, in the, with the intention for, for desegregation, right? Uh, with the intention for integration. Um, what it actually would say is black or non-black in Milwaukee public schools, because um, the schools were, were such majority African-American. And um, yeah, so I remember my father had this, um, Argument. My parents got divorced when I was fifteen, uh, but one memorable <laughs> argument. Lo siento, papi. I think you're okay with me telling this at this point. Uh, remember, he like pounded the table and he said, "We are not white people." And it was like it was an argument with my mom where he felt that his identity was being a you know, and the identity that he would fight like hell to pass to his kids mm -hmm. was 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 being erased, you know. Um, and I guess, you know, I first heard the term mestizo or mestizaje, especially. Um, like not applied to mestizaje, it being like as a concept rather than just it being applied to people calling a person mestizo, you know, and mestiza. Um, I first heard it from my Latino studies teacher in college, Acevedo, high professor Acevedo. Um, Where'd you go to college? Uh, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And, and for me, it was, it was such a relief to have this idea like, oh, it can, there can be, identity can be more than binary. It was just a huge relief. To, to me to learn that, you know, um, and um, in, yeah, and so we, were there Puerto Rican, there wasn't a Puerto Rican festival, there was a Mexican festival, <laughs> when I was a kid, so the, the gente fana de Milwaukee were overwhelmingly uh, Mexicano, um, uh, I mean like 80%, something like that, um, in later years, the the resources of the community definitely grew, and that that's been great for that was great in Abuelita's later years that she had mm -hmm. she loved the um, Centro de la Comunidad Unida, um, which was very intentionally um, culturally welcoming to Mexicanos, gente me de, of Mexican descent, and people of Puerto Rican and Dominican descent, which were the main groups in Milwaukee. Um, and she just loved that she got to speak Spanish 
Um, cause as she got older, she had less and less time for English, even though she, she'd done, you know, she had two graduate degrees that she got in English, right? Work, working, writing, you know, reading in English. Um, este, but when we were growing up, the, yes, we did have festivals, but they were DIY, right? It was, it was yeah. us. It was, it was our family and the Casares family mostly. And a couple of other, oh, and the other Casares family, <laughs> there were, um, to, to, uh, my padrino, Dr. A. Casares looked at a phone book when this used to be a thing back in the day and noticed there was another Dr. A. Casares. He was like, I'm going to call him. He cold called this guy and they turned out to both be Puerto Rican. And so the, <laughs> those were the three families that I remember we would try to parrandear. Right, we would try to parranda, um, and the door-to-door -door thing didn't really work out when you don't have a barrio, really, when you don't have a neighborhood right. where you can walk and go door to door. Um, but but we definitely did. Um, I said patria in in the spaces where we have, and and again, it was it was really great for me that I as the more I came to understand the way my family were Puerto Rican, um, the, the more I came to appreciate that what we had, in, what we had in common was that we were mixed, you know? Um, and, and, and we liked it. You need both of those, right? If you're mixed and you hate it, you know, that's La Chavienda de, de America Latina. That's that's a that's a big that's horror. That's what happened with Victoria, right? My my great my great grandmother. Um, but um, the yeah, we were mixed and we loved it. And um, Aid, my padrino in particular, and my father were just total hams. So um, if there was a family gathering. Uh, Abe would play the piano and Papi would sing and and we'd be playing drums and see sí, este, haciendo patria. Wow. Sí, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to practice the old tradition of parandas yes. in Milwaukee yes. amongst a very limited family. Kudos. Y, y con el frío. Big applause to your father for telling <laughs> me. Uh, they're definitely in the cold. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy cold, man. Crazy. Cold. Wow, what a story. Different than here. Like it's cold enough that your your guitar is gonna break, right? <laughs> like if you're outside too long. We 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 do, um, we do, um, will will break if it's if it's out in the cold too long. Twenty three years old, moving to the Bronx, back yeah. to the Bronx. Yeah, yeah. What was that thinking process before coming here? Why did you decide to come back to the Bronx? You know, what was the reasoning and the thinking behind that? Yeah. Um, uh, well, I think uh, I lived first. I lived in Harlem for a couple of years, and then and then I came. Um, and you know, I I lived in Harlem. I wanted to go both to Harlem and the Bronx because those places, um, the the cultural phenomenon that were most important to me if they had a, a a birthplace it was those places right like i loved jazz from an early age um like i've only reluctantly had to like come out of the closet as a rapper after realizing i just written a lot of rap you mm -hmm. know <laughs> um because my love affair with hip-hop took a pit stop almost flip-flop on this gangsta ish start to drop but before that i loved old school soul and jazz and I could always feel the freedom in jazz right you know and and so so that was Harlem to me and I was like a swing kid in the like uh like Lindy Hop revival in the late 90s and early aughts um but on top of that guys I always loved hip-hop and hip-hop to scene and I love salsa um and and Bobby always seemed so so the Bronx drew me in that sense since I was a creative person right and also Bobby always seemed kind of twice exiled 
you know? And when, and I try, and I went to Puerto Rico to study bomba in college, and I'm really glad that I did that. I was able to get fluent, y, and my voice, mi voz como cantador salió del, del tambor afri Puerto Ricano. Um, and so I'm grateful for that. But my closest friend in Puerto Rico um, told me, like, you know, I think you need to go back to New York to look for your roots, you know, and that, and that meant, that meant the Bronx, you know. Um, yeah, so Papi had a, felt twice exiled in a sense. There was this sense that he carried over from Abuelita feeling exiled from Puerto Rico, you know, and then, and then <sighs> exiled from, exiled from lo que Abuelita decía, um, la patria de Dios, el sur de Bronx. Uh, God, South Bronx is God's country. That's what Abuelita would say. And, and Papi would say, um, if people asked him where he was from, he would say, este, Yo soy de la capital del mundo latino, el Bronx. You know? Yeah. So, 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 yeah, it had a big mythic value in my head. And then as I, um, as I would actually meet, as I would actually be here, um, I just liked it too, <laughs> you know, yeah, I just liked it. So where are you from in the Bronx now? What yeah. neighborhood? So um, I live in like the lower concourse, um, uh, close to the uh, ways up from Yankee Stadium, not too far from Bronx Museum of Art and Borough Hall. Okay. And that's that, yeah. It's deep in the South Bronx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, almost, almost opposite end of the D train. Yeah, opposite end of the D train if you stay in the Bronx, basically. Yeah. 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 Right around the corner. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Uh, and when you came back to the Bronx at 23 years old, what was your impression? You talk about it being mythical, you know, yeah, and your yeah, father talking yeah, about yeah. it. But when you got here, what was the reality? Yeah. Sights, sounds. Well, the reality, sounds. the reality, I mean, what I'm, uh, Pastor, if I let myself, I'm still, if I let myself be unguarded about it, man, I'm still head over heels in love with the Bronx, man. That's awesome. I love the Bronx. Um, and um, most people, just think it's, it's an extreme feeling, so I kind of try to be careful how much I, I show it. But uh, yeah, man, you know, what, what, I, what I really found, first of all, is constantly... Um, every time I just saw something beautiful in the Bronx, either like, you know, how we, hardly any stations have um, elevators, but but neighbors help a, a neighbor carry a, a baby carriage up the stairs. Like that's a beautiful moment of cooperation that that I don't think we stop and appreciate very often. You know, um, moments like that often. Um, are quite striking to me and just like the the moral courage of, of Bronxites, people who who um, have so much um, face so many challenges, you know, and just show up, you know, um, every day. Like the moral courage of the people I'm on the train with is is very inspiring to me, you know. Um, and um, and and then every time I see, uh, and then just actually the actual physical beauty of the Bronx is I very much enjoy, and I think it's more meaningful to me because as a kid I was trying to figure out this paradox that on the news, you know, growing up in the '80s, uh, and we, my parents consumed a fair amount of news, um, the Bronx. Uh, well, the Bronx and Detroit um, were, were places that would be used as if they, you had to spit it out of your mouth, that word, you know, those words, like they were curse words, mm -hmm. you know, and 
my parents used them and my abuelita used them like they were names of God. <laughs> you know, I was like, wow, how is this? And, and the, so even just when I notice um, este, um, so even when I just notice the physical beauty of a part of the Bronx, it's like healing. It's like, it's like disproving that that slander that I grew up hearing, um, you know, about the Bronx. That's great, you know, that's, uh, that reminds me of, you know, you had, you know, off topic, you, you were speaking about having uh, conducted tours here in the Bronx in the past. Yeah. Would you, uh, and I see where the passion comes from. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, tell us about those tours and maybe highlight some of the spots where, and landmarks yeah. on those tours that you used to give and why yeah. they were so important to your route. Okay, yes, good. Honestly, I, I can, I'll, I'll, let me tackle this two ways. Um, uh, can I tell you like the three places, three or four places I would take people? Yes. If I didn't, okay, yes, yes. let me do it that way. All right. Because the, also, let me say the positive first. Okay. So, yeah, man, my, my argument, like, as coming of age, I became very interested in um, cities also, right, generally. Because I also grew up in this context where um, cities themselves were slandered as being centers of immorality, you know, and that there was shame in just living in a city. And in Milwaukee, in many ways, that's more dramatic, you know. Um, but when I learned New York history, um, uh, the uh, Rick or Ken Burns documentary, this 10-part New York documentary, um, they, they start with this frame of this expression from Central Europe that city air breathes free or breathing city air makes you free. Uh, that was an expression from like the Middle Ages because if uh, a serf escaped their uh, feudal master and survived for a year in a city, uh, they would be considered henceforth at, um, forevermore free, right? They would be a free person. And the city was the only place you could escape to, right? Because everything else had an owner and one master and cities had this mix of activities are these mix of interests that were sort of conflicted with each other and, and in the spaces in between you could you could get in where you fit in you know and um either it, sometimes as an individual worker also as communities you know um and and so just that notion of of that the city itself is important um became one of the most important ideas to me as i as I came of age. Um, and if that, and that's especially more important today with climate change, right? Because we don't need a new technology to stop and even reverse global warming. To reverse it, we need trees. To stop it, we need the city. We need the walkable city, you know? Like the carbon footprint of the average New Yorker is, uh, I think, a third of the average person in the United States. And that's just, because so many people can live their daily lives without having to drive as much, you know, that you can walk, you know, cities are really important. If, but if New York is worth its salt, if New York matters at all, the Bronx has to matter. If city air breathes free, that will be proven or disproven in the Bronx. That is, is what I think Bronx history demonstrates. Um, especially really over the whole, the whole arc of Bronx, the urban history of, of the Bronx. And um, so I love um, to visit places where that's still unfolding, like Majora Carter's businesses, right? Um, Majora Carter um, is very consciously... Um, is very consciously 
yeah, te testing that <laughs> that question. Um, does does yeah, throughout her career, she's tested that question, right? Does City Air breathe free? Earlier on, literally with uh, sustainable South Bronx, right? Um, and and now um, more figuratively, um, can can Bronx people can people in Hunts Point have have cultural spaces that make them feel great about who they are, you know, um, as and in her businesses, the Boogie Down Grind and and Bronxlandia, you know, um, performance venue. Um, People walk in and out. Okay. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So, like, I think it's it's meaningful to to visit, um, yeah, a, a space like Bronx Bronxlandia or um, Boogie Down Grind. Um, it's meaningful to it's really meaningful to visit um a community organization uh and or uh, a congregation um because the bronx the other thing that's like i think bronxology should be a really important uh area of study for uh interest even beyond the bronx because there's no other place that was built up in 50 years, burned down in 30 years, and built up in 20, right? You know, um, like, like much of the Bronx was, you know? And other places in the United States were torn down as much, but they haven't rebuilt many of them in the same way that, that the Bronx has. And the, so it's really important to visit those community organizations because that rebuilding didn't happen in the uh, narrative that we have in most uh, in mainstream discourse about how cities redevelop. What's what do you think the the key word I may be thinking of here is gentrification, right? So I'm not saying there's not gentrification in the Bronx. What I'm saying though is that's not what rebuilt that's very clearly demonstrated and you know so the the bronx was built was rebuilt with uh like three billion dollars that was uh mobilized uh under the koch administration and spent in in the like 20 years after the koch administration but but and spent to build affordable housing on a not-for-profit basis with local partners you know um and that just kind of demonstrates oh i guess there's not, it demonstrates that the choice between development and um, displacement is false, right? You know, we can have nice things and still have to be in our neighborhoods. We still can have that, that diversity. So yeah, a cultural space I'd, I'd want to visit, a, like a very contemporary cultural space, a community organization, um, like maybe Sustainable South Bronx, maybe Sebco, which is the, uh, the landlord of Boogie Down Grind. Um, uh, maybe, um, and, and then a cultural space of, of heritage, a few of them, maybe. So Casa Madeo, um, if they're still going, I have not been by in a they few are. months. They are still going. Okay. Hey, Mike. Keep the faith. Um, I promise I'm gonna buy something soon. <laughs> Casa Medio. Um, yeah, so the oldest um, Latin music uh, business in New York City. Um, and, and then also, um, I like 183rd Street. You can kind of, we don't, to try to kind of find a contemporary um, main street of an immigrant uh, community, in some ways 183rd Street, uh, the Dominican community can be a good place to get a sense of that. Um, and yeah, I love I love Bronx literally. I love the the multi generational family businesses. The the families there are just so um, generous hearted. Um, and, and I also, when I gave Bronx Little Italy tours, um, the, uh, 
I, I came to think that the reason that the fires kind of came, I think the fire, the arson epidemic was, was caused by redlining and infrastructure, um, bad infrastructure, right? That, that, that the fires were concentrated on in the middle of the Bronx where the neighborhoods had grown up along the third Avenue L um, and that L was ripped out in 1973 and the peak of the fires was in the decade after that you know so um it would have been possible and that area had been redlined generations before right so for like since the 30s you couldn't get funding for renovations to those buildings you know you can get bank loans for that and then um all of a sudden you didn't have mass transit from there you know so if you could, as um, uh, books like um, Can't Stop, Won't Stop by Jeff Chang report, um, you could buy an apartment building for $1,000, but still make like a $60,000 payout off of fire insurance. You know, the perverse incentive is very clear. I think it's possible those fires, you know, Bronx Little Italy was on the old Third Avenue L line. And I think it's possible those fires could have just kept burning all the way up through the whole Bronx, right? Um, there wasn't anything that inevitably would have stopped it, but I think Bronx Little Italy did. Okay. And and I think that's I think that's kind of amazing. And and the the main reason, so in a sense, Italian food, or at least the love of Italian food, saved the Bronx, because. Um, yeah, the Catholic church institutions there and those family businesses and Fordham University, all those could have left, but but they didn't. Anyhow, I appreciate them for that. You know, I saw a fascinating quote on your Instagram page, you know, and I'm going to, you know, I'm paraphrasing it. Okay, cool. You know, uh, it says, you ever noticed how a city bus between every stop a new community is born? Hi. Beautiful quote. Gracias. Give us a little bit of history of that, where it comes from, Gracias. you know, and why. Thank you. It was so important for you to put that quote on the Instagram. Yeah, man. Um, este... Ah, yeah. Um, bueno, um, you know, there's the great Langston Hughes poem, The, the Negro Speaks of, of Rivers, you know. Um, he says, I've known rivers. And it's like, I've known rivers. Wagwas, you know, <laughs> I, I, it would, would, it's sort of my, what I, one thing I think of in response to that, oh man, I've known Wagwas. And um, yeah, when, um, if city air breathes free, it counts on La Guagua, man, right? You know, este, and, and I remember maybe the thing that expressed it, that brought it home the most powerfully for me was the first time I remember hearing um, an elder deploy the expression, hay cariño o no hay cariño? You know, you ever hear that expression? No. Okay, it's it's interesting. I've only heard it a few, cause like the situation has to be pretty out of control for you, <laughs> for you to play the cariño card, right? But, um, but um, yeah, guaguas buses have been central to my, uh, life experience right and and i like i embrace that proudly um when i was a kid there was shame in not in not driving but as i like got really concerned about really wanting to loving cities wanting to connect with my neighbors and like concerned about climate change i was like yo guagua swag man i'm, I'm proud of this i embrace it and um the most that that community point like um yeah, like I, I, I want to know where I live now on the lower concourse. Um, I know, I know almost everybody in my building. I like that, you know. Um, but I don't know people on the next block, you know. And and then on the bus though, like, yeah, we're all together in that space for a while. And the the most dramatic expression of it. Uh, I, I remember was um, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, 2000, 2001, I was, I was there to study Bomba 
and that meant these long bus rides sometimes um, from the places where I could take classes. San Dulce, Viejo San Juan, and Loisa Aldea. And um, on a long bus ride, uh, I think I was trying to get to Lois Aldea. There were people trying to go in the bus and out of the bus at the same time, right? And this um, black Puerto Rican elder um, says, Hay cariño o no hay cariño? And it was understood that the answer was, Hay cariño. So, all right, we, we better figure out how to share the space, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so to translate that means, gosh, it's something you couldn't imagine hearing that in English, not if you literally translate it. But it was, um, I guess it would be kind of, you kind of hear the way African-Americans deploy the word love in some contexts um, is, is sim similar. Like, show your love for... You know, that's asking like for applause, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, that's basically what he was saying. So is there love? Is there love in the room or not? Is there affection or is there not affection? And the answer is, ay cariño, ay cariño. Um, and yeah, it's about sharing space, you know. And, and I guess the other thing I take away from it is... Um, I don't think you can share space without some degree of mutual influence. Hey, so, I, yeah, I got a song called Meet Me in the Bronx. With, uh, you can consult that. That's kind of a, a walking tour. And, and, I, and I open, my last version of it, I open it with this, like, uh, imagine dialogue. It might be a part of the music. Um, uh, so like a pretend phone call, um, hey, no, I'm downtown, I'm about to, uh, head up to you. You want to meet in the city? What do you mean? You're in the city. The Bronx is a city. We're the most city part of the city. All right, I'm over here. I know you want to see some places you haven't seen before, but I wonder how often do we stop and really see this place where we live? Meet me in the Bronx, there's etc. Right. So the song the song starts from that. That's how I wanted to frame it as like rather than it being about what should a tourist think is interesting about the Bronx. What should Bronxites appreciate about ourselves and you know our our home here? And that's what I'm most passionate about. That's what I get the most joy from from sharing and you know it is often um to to tell though the the history responsibly it's it's it's, it's there's shadow there's darkness right and um but i do think um i can leave part of that to the historians you know and um and go ahead and take the task of trying of, of giving giving well I'm very influenced by that this speech that Dr. King would give uh, about your life's blueprint and your life's blueprint you need a sense of somebody -ness. and that may be really what connects my, my different interests you know um, songwriting and working as a tour guide you know, and then actually working as a barista, where I specifically choose to work as a barista for a black woman boss who's a boss like Majora Carter, you know, um, that that what I'm working on is somebodyness and embodiedness and grace, you know. Um, and for the Bronx, I, yeah, I think also our kind of the, the civic center downtown has some, has, I like uh, using the phrase downtown Bronx, kind of, kind of like arguing 
yeah, uh, we're big enough to be a city, you know, so why not claim the downtown, right? And you could kind of, yeah, you know, so I kind of would mark Borough Hall as at least politically being the downtown of the Bronx, Absolutely. right? You know? Yeah. This is downtown Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that, and we definitely need, I, I want to see, I'd love to see more public art and public art that would represent the authentic, uh, diversity of the Bronx. Oh, one other way I would argue for the significance of the Bronx is that I think the African diaspora is very important. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, it's where we're all from, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I think of, um, Western, like the whole Western Hemisphere cultural identity is, is very much formed by the African diaspora. And the way that my cultural identity, the drums that I play, you know, hip hop, right? There is a unique in history meeting of different parts of the African diaspora in the Bronx today that is unfolding. You know, the global African diaspora is having a family meeting in a sense in the Bronx, you know, how will that develop, how can that be actualized, you know, um, how could that transform culture, I think that's evolving, and it's not as actualized as I'd like to be, because mostly people are trying to survive, right, <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, the African heritage via Santo Domingo, via Puerto Rico, via the United States, via immigration, you know, from West Africa and from uh, the English-speaking Caribbean, you know, all of that comes together in the Bronx. So, yeah, Bronxology uh, is an important branch of Africology, you know, and Black Studies. I think, and of course, also Latina studies. You know, um, you can you could say a similar thing about um, Latin America or different Latin American cultures meeting in a new way um, in in the Bronx. Um, and so, and I think it also demonstrates like, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is like this. Uh, Term, terminology that actually it generally means so what do you blend with white? What do you mix in a little bit with white? You know, there can be there's a lot of diversity with there being no white people <laughs> around. Right? Um, and and actually I think that the old um, statue that fountain across from Borough Hall in the south uh, on 161st Street in Southwest Bronx that's a place I'd, I'd want to take on every Bronx tour. Um, because there, on the one hand, you, it, it's, you can point, it, it illustrates how we need uh, more diversity and a different kind of diversity and representation in our um, public art today, right? I know that most folk walking by it see it as uh, a bunch of half-naked white ladies. Um, and that is not, I'm not arguing against that reading. But I think it's also interesting that there's a whole other way to read that statue. And it's the Heinrich Heine um, monument, and the statue itself is a refugee from white supremacism, is, is, a, is a refugee from racism, right? Because Heine uh, was this, this, this poet who was very popular, um, but his poetry expressed these progressive values that, uh, going back to the, the, the Kaiser, to the um, Prussian Empire, a lot of the powers that be, and I think Aust 
Yeah, definitely the Prussian Empire. A lot of the powers that be in the Germanic world were not comfortable with his work, right? His, um, but his poetry was so popular. That poem in particular, the Lorelei, that the statue is, is sort of illustrating, was so popular that when the Nazis were in power, they found they couldn't ban it. So they just said that it was written by an unknown Aryan. Heine was of Jewish heritage, right? Um, and so the statue was meant to be a gift for the city of its birth, Dusseldorf, but it was rejected by Dusseldorf because of his politics and Jewish heritage. It was brought here by, uh, it's inscribed on the side, side of the fountain um, in German by a committee of Germans in America. And by bringing it here, they were also rejecting the kind of white supremacism that the Kaiser was trying to build his empire with, trying to catch up with the French and British empires that had been built on their own constructions of white supremacism. You know? And um, yeah, that committee of Germans in America was probably um, it was probably a mix of, of, um, of first-generation refugees, of, of, of people of economic migrants, you know, um, of people uh, who were second or maybe third generation. Um, but they saw, um, on, the one, on the one hand, it illustrates how these sort of, you can sort of see these Bronxian themes, you know, over history, and how important it is to be intentionally anti-racist and anti-white supremacist, just to be a healthy human, <laughs> you know, it's been important for me, you know, um, and, um, and to have a positive somebodyness, right? Because that ain't what whiteness is. Whiteness is has always been about what you're not, you know, not positively what what you are. And um, the and, and as we embrace as gente hispana, gente latinoamericana, and um, embrace or Boricuas or Mexicanos embrace what we are, one of, we get pushback for that, right? Um, uh, there's certainly the, the major struggle of Padre uh, Unidos del Bronx was that our kids should have bilingual education as a right, access to bilingual education as, as a right, if there's a language of heritage. Um, apart from English, right? Um, and it's often discussed as if that were a novel claim, but it, I think it's actually just a very natural human expectation, you know? Um, and it's not that Padres Unidos del Bronx, uh, you know, Bronx parents, uh, didn't want good access to good education in English for uh, Latina kids, for poor, overwhelmingly it was Puerto Rican kids, right, in the 60s in the South Bronx, 60s and 70s. Um, but they they said this shouldn't be a binary. We, you know, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have to give up our, our language, our heritage. And I it, I only really realized, actually no, I always knew this in the background about my family, but only as I came of age, and especially moving around the Bronx and learning a little Bronx history, I realized, oh, you know who else felt that way? German immigrants, you know? Um, and so like those Germans putting that inscription in 1898 on the side of this, you know, um, fountain that was going to be planted in the Bronx. They don't even provide an English translation there, right? They just, they put it in German there, you know? Um, so they weren't, 
um, like the I I used to hear this um, nonsense uh, phrase. You're in America now. Speak American, right? Um, but uh, yeah, they weren't having that back in the day. So yeah, and actually, my mom, um, my mom, I I had I had a, a abuela. Didn't really know abuelo, but uh, I had an oma and opa too, you know. So their first language was um, was Spot Deutsch, this regional dialect. Um, but there was um, my oma remembers um, at one point her father said we speak English in this house, and it was it was a response to. To some, some very real persecution of uh, it was basically political persecution, but it was framed in ethnic terms um, of uh, German Americans around World War One and then World War Two, you know. Um, so that and it and in Milwaukee it was about shutting down the Socialist Party because they organized bilingually English and German. You know, um, and the yeah. So I've I've definitely embraced that idea of um, that you don't have to be less for being more. You know, um, and 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 that's maybe one thing I I think I enjoy about the Bronx. I feel like I see that fabulously on display mm -hmm. in so many. Uh, switching gears a little. Yeah. Um, well, we, before we do that, did I get the reason why uh, your father's family ended up moving out of the Bronx initially? Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, it's like he moved out because of an opportunity, and then the opportunity fell through, and then financially we just couldn't afford to move back, right? So up to like age seven, I was always telling people, I'm from New York. Right, <laughs> and then and then and then it just became clear we it was if we moved back, um, you know we'd be we'd be in a tougher place than we'd be in as tough of a place as Abuelita was in the 30s, you know, and um, in Milwaukee, um, huh? Actually, we ended up. Yeah, I think we ended up in Milwaukee because one of the community organizing pastors that my father had worked with in the Bronx moved to Milwaukee, and he had started a, a community organization there, and um, he had a job for Bobby. All right, all right, thank you. Thank you. Switching gears, uh, you know, one of the things you describe yourself on your on your presence on social media is as an idea-driven rapper, yeah. You know, tell us about your rap career, you yeah. know, and uh, tell us about the idea-driven rapper. Yeah, you know, and sure. if you want to drop a few lines, we're right. open to that too. Okay, me encantaría. Okay, great. Let's go there. Este, <laughs> um, uh, okay, I'm see if I, I, um, because I I do write things in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, I um, I I I got. This seemed like a really helpful piece of advice I heard Jay Z share about his process. He's like, um, you know, I'd always lose my notebooks, and so I was always running, like trying to go to the corner store to get, like, can I get like a napkin and to write something down before I forgot it. So I just started memorizing, you know, like, oh, okay, that's cool. I like that. So since I do end up writing things in my head, I've got like, and then I, but then I also write things down. I don't always have the latest version in memory. <laughs> okay. Um, but, um, okay, sure. This is something that's well learned, but idea driven. Um, the persistence of self murat. Yes, I do. The persistence of certain patterns of relations, savage inequalities of social stations, permanent members of the United Nations Security Council charge you 
A hefty fee we could have yet to repay the council if you can't afford it, and the court will appoint it for you in order to administer the means to simply ignore you. 80% of U.S. criminal defendants. Defense depends on public defenders, the 99%, and the 1%ers experience is institutionally distinct. Didn't take an asteroid to make our union extinct. It took a ray gun and an iron lady. She said, where they yes, we can. Um, Definitely, maybe. Definitely, maybe. Probably, perhaps. Do you hear the people smatter of snaps and golf claps? Do you hear the people singing along with hip-hop while preserving prejudice, formal hypocrisy? Stop. And what do we mean by what we're rapping? Do we care about a badness? Is it straight up like Ellen and all her outness or locked in the closet like our Kelly could have to say? Can hip-hop be cheerful? Can rappers be gay? The happy heart of the star in the block that Mackinac said he hadn't been to, but I hope by now he's come through. It ain't that hard to get to. 1520 Cedric Avenue. I'll take you. <laughs> Great. I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> Where can we find your app? Ah, um, so um, macrocedarwala.com and just click on, um, click on. Yeah, click on click on uh, albums there or my Bandcamp page. Um, so another so so that that song is um, that song is is set to "We Shall Overcome" the protest anthem, right? Um, and and it's called "Someday," right? Because that's uh, that's part of uh, the refrain, right? "We shall overcome someday," right? Um, and that's a kind of um, spoken word style, last poet style interrogation of, of a problem and sort of free association off of rhyme, you know. Um, I've also um, been, I've also definitely been idea driven um, in, in, in practicing the, the tradition of homage. You know, um, and and also even just like trying to figure out things. Um, yeah, so I think those are two two other ways I've been idea driven. So um, I wrote um, a couple of songs um, to remind my friend who she is when she uh, was facing lots of negative attacks as she ran for city council. You know, so these ended up being um, a couple of songs for for the Irina Sanchez um, for her original primary uh, campaign, and she's on city council now. Uh, oh. The songs do not do it, but I offered what I could. Um, but so let me off just do the intro to one of the songs from of, her. Of course, is this okay. from the PSA for PAS? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, oh no, actually that one, that one, that one, that's the one in English. I think I want to do the one, a little bit of the one. Of course. If that's cool. Anyone okay. more comfortable. Cool, great. Este, because I think I want to do the one in Spanish because the, the, the PSA or public service announcement for PAS, and I like how if you said that out loud, you could say it like five, you know, which means peace in Spanish, but it's Pierre not Ana Sanchez. Um, that one takes a similar mode to that kind of argumentative <laughs> style, where Josh Polini, uh, the host of um, Afropop Worldwide, has described the jelly or grill as a uh, hereditary praise poet. And I'm like, yes, I'm that. But not to the king, to the plus. You know? <laughs> for y, y gente de la guagua. So, tú sabes la cosa esa que hace, no sea, que quien me empresa, se vende la china de jugo pelá. One for two, two for three dollars. El abuelo lo hizo a los noventa años y pico con manos fuertes de campo chino, regalando la mitad de la fruta a los niños. Digo, no sé si harina, ron nacida, es de familia humilde de Santo Domingo, sacando vida aquí en el ron. Granny and Romani, Pierina, Ereline, the Dio, Amada, Negrita, Linda, Fuerte, Capas, no Susto, but you know you got to do much, but you don't forget the Don de Vendrat. Pues, 
Um, so as I do that out loud, I realize I'm very much, um, yeah, like I accept, I accept like rapper or not rapper, whatever makes you more comfortable, right? Because people, there are these like authenticity tests with hip hop sometimes, you know? But I, but my thought is that hip hop has, um, has their various streams that came in to form hip hop, you know? And I'm, I'm, I'm much more influenced from kind of the stream that ranges from um, preachers to spoken word poets, C.D. Thomas, um, uh, the last poets, um, and um, and yeah, you know, like rappers do a lot of beefing. I I don't know if this will ever work, but I I thought like what I like to do is agua cantando, because I imagine that avocadoing would be a, an opposite of beefing. Anyhow, so I'm, uh, uh, I'm trying to be comida criolla and uh, kind of veganish. Um, so, uh, but I'm trying to do the opposite of beefing. I'm more interested in that generally if I can, right? If I can be, if I can be a praise poet, right? Praise and positivity. And I'm very conscious as I as I did that just now, I realized, oh man, I sound just like the old school declamadores, um, which is um, a, a rich tradition in, in Puerto Rico um, that I that I in, definitely encountered as a key aspect of of the African Afro Boricua um, cosmology that that I encountered when I when I studied Bomba, you know. Um, so, so in that in that piece, basically, um, I'm talking about there there were I'm talking about the Arena Sanchez um, city councilwoman the Arena Sanchez real family story of, of how um, of her real working class background, you know, real Bronx background, and um, how experiences like how her abuelo, her grandfather, um, had the need to supplement the family's income, you know, the, I think the extended family, yeah, the, that, that she survived through cooperation of an extended family, you know, that she has, uh, and her abuelo, you know, were helping her parents out and that's how they were, that's how they got by, you know, and, um, and abuelo, was um, doing this thing that I think of as just very, very, it seems very culturally emblematic, right? That, that uh, oranges, juice oranges that you would have, you buy a thing that you can, you, 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 you get the skin yeah. off, you peel them, you peel them, right? Mm -hmm. But you kind of half peel them, right? Because you still got part of the uh, peel on so you can, but you get the hard part of the peel off. So then you squeeze it and it becomes, both the juice and the cup, right? So you squeeze it and you get the orange, the, the freshest of fresh squeezed orange juices. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something I saw for the first time in Puerto Rico. Um, but yeah, that's, he used to drive a cart like that around, or push a cart like that around the, around the Bronx. Um, and that's where she comes from. And she knows that, you know. And, um, and I, and she went to Harvard. And she came back. And I think that's just extraordinary. And I love to love to sing the praises of that, right? You know? You are. <laughs> Thank you, brother. You yeah. are. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's switch up a little. Cool. You know, uh, tell us about your album, Code Switch. Yeah. An anthem of intersectional identity. Yeah. And the inspiration behind that. Yeah, man. Ah, so, um, code switching, um, you know, I, I, I haven't read a lot about this, but one Latina linguist that was um, a friend of uh, Maestra that I worked with as, as a dancer, Amadella Gonzalez, um, she, she uh, argued to me that the term code switching is, is, um, 
largely developed um, originally by people, uh, by linguists, by um, Boricua or New Rican linguists and people looking at New Rican, um, realizing that like um, the notion of bilingual isn't really describing what's going on here. Right. Right. <laughs> no, it's Mataya, right? There's something, there's something richer, positive, to say it positively, right? Richer that's going on here. And um, yeah, and so apart from switching uh, to English, between English and Spanish, that there's that code switching um, is. That, that in positive terms, code switching, uh, they notice that speakers uh, will, will, will code switch for a variety of reasons and that it actually, in positively, it enriches the discourse, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, code, you code switch in a way that emphasizes your affinity with that other person. You know, you code switch to Spanish as sort of like, even if you both speak English, as a sort of recognition of a uh, kinship, of a kind of kinship, at least, you know, and um, and that our language, like that, Puerto Ricans had lots of that our English was partly. Um, encountered in formal settings and partly encountered in informal settings and that had a lot of influences that um, actually both of those Englishes, I would argue, that both the formal English and the informal English is is very that the the influence of black Englishes is essential to the in, to the Englishes of Puerto Rican in that, so, yeah, both formally and informally, I would argue. I think especially in churches, you can hear the formal uh, black English having uh, formed the Englishes of uh, Latine congregations mm -hmm. that are that are using English uh, as well as Spanish now, you know? Um, and yeah, and in academic settings, I think our kind of frame about, um, you know, a frame about uh, social justice is very formed by African American language and thinking about the African American social justice struggles, you know. And then certainly informally, uh, I remember um, it, it when we when I took Latino studies in college, it was observed that um, you know boys were losing Spanish at a higher rate than girls were in second and third generation. Hispanic households, you know, in, um, immigrant and migrant households, and the hypothesis they presented was that, um, well, that the, the the gendering of, of girls as um, in expected to be associated with the home, you know, mm -hmm. gave them that expectation to work the language of the home, and then the boys having to themselves in urban settings, like with the language of the street, you know. Um, and I definitely, when when I was in schools that were 80% uh, African American, I definitely found myself thinking with black colloquial English, you know, before I realized I was doing it, you know. And um, yeah. So that, um, and I remember my sister one time said, um, she observed me like I was talking with like Abuelita and then I was talking with her and then I was talking with like a friend from school and I code switch each time, you know, and she was like, wow, you're trilingual, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we're both Yoro Latino. Right, or Euro Latine. Um, but she didn't, her, 
And I think she had, yeah, she had as much time with African Americans growing up as I did, but um, her, she didn't tend to code switch to black colloquialism. But she certainly didn't do it. Well, I think. Um, she didn't. It didn't come up as often that it ended up being something she had to think about consciously, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I, I found that I that I had to. Um, and the um, that positive frame about code switching, about uh, emphasizing your kinship with another person, and just expressing different sides of of your identity, you know, as they may come out in different settings. You know, um, that that seemed that seemed great to me, and it seemed like the best way to explain why I was. Um, mm, this is what it was when I thought when I realized that my songs were my most important creative expressions. The next step was supposed to be marketing and that's supposed to start with labeling yourself. I really dislike the term branding, right? Branded, do you even understand it? What it was, how, what it demanded, right? Human beings have been branded, right? I really dislike the term branding. So anyhow, but you need to label yourself in a certain way for marketing purposes, right? And, um, that was supposed to start with the export so marketing sources I read, um, supposed to start with deciding your genre, you know? And I realized, man, I couldn't decide my genre any more than I could decide whether I was German American or Puerto Rican, you know, or whether, um, whether, whether or not I was going to use black colloquial English, because I realized it was just something that happened, you know, like if my friends, if that's how my friends were communicating, you know, that's how I was communicating, you know, mm -hmm. um, and way before I knew words like black colloquial English, you know, formal language like that. Um, yeah, so code switching, um, the poem that I shared first is the intro to code switching. And um, that was, I realized I had at least an album's worth of songs, but they weren't a single genre, you know. Um, and so that gave me a frame to realize that, okay, these are in different registers, um, but it's the same voice. So. Take it, you know. Yeah. Now, um, do you mind talking about, or you know, um, the Trinity Lutheran Church of New York City? And uh, you know, I, I read uh, if I was looking at one of their pages, I hope I'm not mistaken, but there was a comment there about uh, the mix of Latin roots, music, yeah, hip hop, yeah. and the gospel. I just found that so fascinating. Again, yeah. Latino roots, yeah. music, hip hop. In the gospel. Yeah, yeah. Just, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you talk to us about that? Wepa, gracias. It's exciting to me. I'm glad, <laughs> glad it's exciting to me. Was that correct? Yeah, 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 no, wepa. Yeah, see, sí. este, bueno, um, so, yeah, well, like, to, to go brief, like, code switching was mostly recorded at Trinity, right? So I'm an artist in residence of Trinity, and I'm, um, and basically that's meant, you know, um, if I got a project, they'll let me use space, you know? Um, and our director of music uh, at Trinity, Horace Beasley, has been my primary mentor. And uh, man, he's a cool, he's a person of, he's a New Yorker, right? He's a person of, and he's a guy, he's, he lives in Manhattan, but he, has, he was a Bronxite for a period. And, um, and, and he's just a person who, um, for him, his, he has multiple codes of expression also, right? And creatively, he's uh, really 
uh, fluent in kind of golden age gospel music and Bach. Those are, okay. <laughs> those are his, you know, and musicologically, you can make a really good argument for how they're more related than you might think. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> you know, so that's one meaning of, of gospel, meaning African-American gospel music, that absolutely being one of the basic, um, being one of my first languages, you know, um, cause, cause, um, yeah, I just always had that cause, cause that was at Cross Lutheran Church, uh, in, in Milwaukee, it's the majority, it was an African American ministry, you know, in terms of their focus and majority African American. And I've just always found that like, um, mm, the notion of Mestiza has been meaningful to me because like segregation seemed like a myth in as much as I don't think you can be on the bus even if you put some people in front and some people in the back breathe the same air you know um without in a sense being influenced by each other you know as as human beings that's far more natural than denying that we're influenced by each other and that I think that's definitely been the kind of space that Trinity has worked to create. Um, we'll find out what will be next, you know, in the future. But Horace, we were a very, here's another way to, here's another significance of Bronxology. Bronx people, when, when we leave the Bronx, we're still Bronx people. And the Bronx diaspora is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. in, it, in, in its impact, you know, um, and, and Horace, you know, is somebody who moved through the Bronx, our pastor. And also, yeah, I define that as like, I noticed that many people, maybe not everybody, but many people who even just have a few years living in the Bronx are transformed by that experience in one way or another, you know? Um, and yeah, so Horace had moved through the Bronx. He's originally from Detroit and pastor Heidi, um, was the pastor of the church where I was baptized, um, in, on Longwood Avenue. Yeah. Longwood Avenue in the South Bronx, right back at San Mateo. And, um, yeah, so she certainly brought this, um, liberation theology uh, influenced experience um, to to that ministry, which is the actual churches at 100th and Amsterdam. And my most regular ministry to the church is um, that I'm a percussionist, right? And there are still churches where drums are Satan's instrument, you know? Drums never were Satan's instrument. This is this is uh, white supremacist nonsense and about alienating people from their own cultures. Um, and uh, well, we you know that just from the Bible because there's lots of drumming in the Bible, right? Um, there's dancing and, and drumming and celebration, right, in the Bible. Um, but when I, but yeah, every time I play a drum in church, I'm conscious of that, you know, and I'm, I'm conscious of, of my indebtedness to Mother Africa and how I've been formed by Mother Africa and, um, yeah, given life, given birth to, in a sense, by Mother Africa from, you know, Abuelita's kinky hair, <laughs> you know to the, um, to Poppy's Lamento Borincano, you know, to, um, to the discipleship, um, of, uh, of, of how, how I've embraced. So those three things together, right? Gospel, the gospel, hip hop, and, um, Latina roots music, um, Hip hop, the hip hop connection being um, that 
I think, um, yeah, I, I think there's a, I think there's a sacred root to hip hop that we don't that we maybe don't consider that much. But there wouldn't be rappers if there hadn't first been black preachers. You know, it, um, the, the, and and then Latina roots music. Um, mm, when I when I studied bomba in, in Puerto Rico, uh, and to show how far we come, if you want to study bomba now, you can do that pretty easily in most major metropolitan areas where there's some Puerto Rican diaspora, right? But at that time, like we had like one friend who was a bombero, but you can't be you can't do bomba with one bombero, right? You need you need a community, right? And um, and even though my household was very cultural and Dr. Abe, my padrino, was ethnomusicologist, right? Like we didn't nobody had a barril, nobody had a bomba drum. They didn't they weren't manufactured, right? So that we had LP, we had the drums that were that were sold in stores that were manufactured, and those were congas, those were Afro Cuban, you know, instruments. Um, right, eleven of thirteen of um, Machitos Afro Cubans were Puerto Ricans. But they didn't play their own drums, you know, um, because there was this particular expression of, of of white supremacism combined with colonial status, you know, that just um, meant that although people were Puerto Ricans were embracing, were struggling to say yes, we're Afri Caribbeans, mm -hmm. you know, and we're going to participate in the development of this music our own roots music, our own, the term they would use that Modesto Cepeda taught me to use is autoctona, musica autoctona, autochthonous music coming from geology, uh, uh, a stone that's found in the place where it was formed, you know, um, is autochthonous. And um, our own autochthonous music was cut off from uh, the commercial development that, that uh, Puerto Ricans have participated in, and it really still is. Um, and um, Modesto, and that was even in the church, right? Modesto was uh, definitely identified as um, a practicing Catholic, and he was well known as a folklorist, but it was only, and he was in his 60s, but it was only when I was there that he was invited to play the drums the first time in church, you know? Um, and my my whole project, um, yeah. So anyhow, that's that's a thought. Uh, that's a few thoughts <laughs> about how those things come together. Um, but for my whole project as a songwriter um, really started from um, when we were in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and and I would ask where we were we were in the car and Papi would flip through the radio dial and I would ask, and I was looking for Puerto Rican music. Mm -hmm. And my father, uh, maybe this is where I get it from, uh, never gives a simple answer <laughs> to any question, right? You know, and so he would, he would um, eventually describe how, well, that's a merengue and originally from Dominican Republic that's a salsa, that rhythm is Guaronco, that's originally from Cuba, you know? Um, and I was, I, was tr I was trying to hack that problem, why isn't there Puerto Rican music on the radio in Puerto Rico, you know? And, but how can I work on that from my social location as a Euro Latino, German Rican in the Bronx, right? What, what I've come back to that um, is the drum, you know. And in my in my new recordings, um, I'm intend to set the to enforce this discipline on myself, where um, it's mostly hip hop. I'll bring in different genres, but in terms of the beats, I want to embrace working with the view that the autochthonous rhythms of Puerto Rico are sufficient. And um, just because I finally have all the right instruments for it. I didn't have a barril until very recently, actually. Um, and, um, and yeah, but um, 
working with um, work and work and trying to hack the problem of how how can you make hand drums be heard, you know, and not just have them fall in the background of a recording. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, that's what I'm very interested in and inspired by right now. You spoke a lot about you know, percussionists. Yeah. Gongas, you know, produced by LP. Yeah. You know, and the barils, the bomba. Yeah, barils, the bomba. But I noticed that you have a certain passion for the tambor. Oh, yeah. Talk to us about the tambourine. Oh, oh, the tambourine. Oh, well, so tambourine, yeah, I do appreciate the tambourine. Bueno, cuando digo tambor in español, I just mean drum in general. Gotcha, that's gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, That's the usage of tambor that I mean. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Great. And before we go into our final question, okay. is there anything else you'd like to tell us about mm. or inform us about yourself, your relationship with the Bronx? Mm. Thank you. Hmm. The you know I've I've come definitely come to a place where um, the romantic I realize how there's some romanticization in my father's Bronx stories or at least the way I would hear them right. Um, I guess I've come around to how it's good to be able to see things without that, you know, you need to sometimes, but you also need the romance, you know, it's, uh, it's good. Um, and in general, I just think it's great. Um, I think the Bronx is uniquely significant for and what what gente Latina have 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 done culturally in the Bronx um, to face the oppressions that that um, are that we suffer here and yet I said patria. You know, make make nation, make a community. Um, is is it's an extraordinary accomplishment. It's very much um, something to be proud of. You know, and um, yeah, I don't think we are. I don't think we are very often. We're aware of our failures, but um, you know. I'm uh, not aware of, of how miraculous our, um, uh, our sure resistance and survival is, but also achievements, even positive um, achievements. And um, we're not aware of that because we don't have the institutions that, be, because spaces where we can see that are, are just very rare, you know. Um, and that that's a big a big project that I think deserves a lot of resources. Um, but um, bueno, in any um, you can't have bomba really with one person, probably not even two, but three. <laughs> You're good. You're good. You could have someone on the lead. Uh, on the call, someone, not, two people holding down the response, the coro, you know, and you have at least, yeah, you, you can each be playing a rhythm instrument. You're good, and, and you can take turns dancing, right? So, um, yeah, I think on whatever scale we can, it's great to um, do what you're making space for here, tell our stories, celebrate ourselves, and and even also, maybe if it's just two or three gathered, um, as it was kind of with us and the the sisters before this conversation, you know, mm -hmm. um, mother daughter, your mother daughter, that was beautiful, right? Yeah. Um, bueno, in ital, bueno, 
tal vez no haciendo patria, sino haciendo familia extendida. You know? mm -hmm. um, and, and it's great to work on this in institutional ways, as I, as I see you working to do quite laudably. I'm proud of you, Pastor. Thank um, you. <laughs> um, I, I, I see you working to do quite laudably with, with this important institution, Bronx Historical Society, because um, VXology is important, and, um, and, and, and Majora and others working to do. Um, uh, she's Angra, but certainly a friend, parte de la familia extendida, mm -hmm. certainly part of the extended family, you know, um, and, and cultural spaces um, that she makes um, available, that are going to be available for, for gente latina in, um, in the Bronx. That work, I just affirm it and celebrate it. Um, see yourself to be yourself, be yourself to free yourself. Awesome. And we like, regardless, we have quite a few oral history projects and initiatives. Uh, but regardless, mm -hmm. we end every oral history here at the Bronx, beautiful weather, um, with one question. What does the Bronx mean to you? Uh, yeah, the Bronx is, uh, I think, well, it's the place where I can work on um, both self-actualization, be my whole self, um, develop my gifts, you know, and I can participate and, and I can apply, what was it? Uh, I think I learned this in church or school, I can't remember, but that idea that an ethic for it to be a just ethic, you have to be able to uh, wish that everyone would do it and it would still be, it would still work, still mm -hmm. be ethical, you know? So it's both, it's a space where I can work on that and I, and there potentially is a space for everybody, um, every kind of person to, to self-actualize, to build their community, um, de la guagua, <laughs> right? Ethically have a, have a low carbon footprint, have a, have a city work on that project of um, yeah, so, so if, if that's going to happen anywhere, I think it, I think the Bronx is a, I think it has to happen in the Bronx, um, for U.S. American democracy to be real, it has to be real in the Bronx, you know, for city air to breathe free, it has to be, it has to breathe free and hopefully clean in the Bronx, you know, um, and, and if we want to celebrate if if we're gonna be a if we are one people, as I, I was very stirred when I first heard Barack, Barack Obama assert in, in in speeches, you know, if we are one people in these United States of America, that has to be happening in La Juaras. That has to be happening on the buses in the Bronx. Great, okay. Bronx keeps creating it. B X. That's right. Forever. That's right. Well, Marcos de Jesus, also known as Marcos de la Guagua, Epa. for the Bronx Latino History Project. Thank you. A la orden. Como decía mi abuelita. <laughs>